Hello everybody, I hope you're doing well today. I'm just carrying on with where I left off at the end of the last episode. You're a beautiful home, said Agatha. Thank you. Milk and sugar? Mrs Bloxby had a small, delicate, lined face and brown hair threaded with grey. She was slim and fragile, with long, delicate hands. The sort of hands that portrait painters use to love to give their subjects. And how are you setting in, Mrs Rosen? Not very well, said Agatha. I may have to settle out. Oh, because of your quiche, said Mrs Bloxby tranquilly. Do try tea cake. I make them myself and it's one of the few things I do well. Yes, a horrible affair. Poor Mr Cummings Brown. People must think I'm a dreadful person, said Agatha. Well, it was unfortunate that wretched quiche should have cowbane in it. But a lot of cheating goes on in these village affairs. You're not the first. Agatha sat with the tea cake dripping butter and stared at the vicar's wife. I'm not. No, no. Uh, let me see. There was Miss Temby five years ago, an incomer, set her heart on winning the flower arranging competition. She ordered a basket of flowers from the florist over at St Anne's. Quite blatant about it. It was a very pretty display, but the neighbours had seen the florist van arriving and so she was found out. Then there was old Mrs Carter. She bought her strawberry jam and put her own label on it and won. No one would have ever known if she had not drunk in the red line and bragged about it. Yes, your deception would have occasioned quite a lot of comment in the village, Mrs Raisin. But it, but had it, Mrs Raisin, had it not all happened before, or for that matter, if the judging had been fair. Do you mean Mr Cummings Brown cheated? Mrs Bloxby smiled. Let's just say he was apt to give prizes to favourites. But if this was generally known, why did the village bother to enter anything at all? Because they are proud of what they make and like to show it off to their friends. Besides, Mr Cummings Brown judged competitions in neighbouring villages and it is estimated he had only one favourite in each. Also, there is no disgrace in losing. Alf often wanted to change the judge, but the Cummings Browns did give quite a lot to charity and the one year Alf was successful and got someone else to judge, the judge gave the prize to his sister, who does not even live in the village. Agatha let out a slow breath. You make me feel like less of a villain. It was all very sad. You must have had a frightful time. To Agatha's horror, her eyes filled with tears and dabbed at them fiercely while the vicar's wife looked tactfully away. But be assured, the vicar's wife addressed the coffee pot that your deception did not occasion all that much comment. Beside, besides, Mr Cummings Brown was not popular. Why? The vicar's wife looked evasive. Some people are not, you know. Agatha leaned forward. Do you think it was an accident? Oh yes, for if it were not, then one would naturally suspect the wife. But Vera Cummings Brown was a most devoted wife in her way. She has a great deal of money and he had very little. They have no children. She could have walked off and left him at any time. I had to help comfort her on the day of her husband's death. I had never seen a woman more grief-stricken. It is best to put the whole matter behind you, Mrs. Raisin. The Castle Lady Society meets tonight here at the vicarage at eight o'clock. Do come along. Thank you, said Agatha, humbly. Have you got rid of that dreadful woman? asked the vicar ten minutes later when his wife walked into his study. Yes, I don't think she's really so bad, and she's genuinely suffering, suffering about the quiche business. I've invited her to the woman's get-together tonight. And thank goodness I won't be here, said the vicar, and bent over his sermon. Agatha felt cleansed of sin as she drove back to her cottage. She would go to church on Sunday, and she would try to be a good person. She put a healthy, fun shepherd's pie in the microwave for Mrs Simpson's lunch. Mrs Simpson picked at the hot mess tentatively with her fork, and all Agatha's saintliness evaporated. It's not poisoned, she snapped. It's just I don't care much for frozen stuff, said Mrs Simpson. Well, I'll get you something better next time. Was Mrs Cummings Brown very upset about the death of her husband? Oh, dreadful it was, said Doris Simpson. Real shock here. Real shock her were. Numb with shock at first, and then crying and crying. Had to fetch the vicar's wife to help. Guilt once more settled on Agatha's soul. She felt she had to get out. She walked the red line and ordered a glass of red wine and sausage and chips. Then she remembered her intention of calling on Mrs Cartwright. It all seemed a bit pointless now, but it was something to do. 
Judd's cottage, where the Cartwrights lived, was a broken down sort of place. The garden gate was hanging on its hinges and in the weedy front garden was parked a rusting car. Agatha looked this way and that, wondering how the car got in, but could see no way it could have been achieved short of lifting it bodily over the fence. The glass pane of the front door was cracked and stuck in place with brown paper tape. She rang the bell and nothing happened. She rapped at the side of the door, Mrs Cartwright's blurred figure looming up on the other side of the glass. Oh, it's you, she said when she opened the door. Come in. Agatha followed her into a sour-smelling cluttered living room. The furniture was soiled and shiny to wear. There were two bar electric. There was a two bar electric fire in the grate with imitation plastic coals on the top. A bunch of plastic daffodils hung over a chipped vase on the window. There was a cocktail cabinet in one corner ornamented with pink glass and strips of pink fluorescent lighting. Drink? asked Mrs Cartwright. Her coarse hair was wound up in pink foam rollers and she was wearing a pink wrap dress over which gaped as she moved to reveal a dirty petticoat. Thank you, said Agatha, wishing she had not come. Mrs Cartwright poured two glasses of gin and then tinged them pink with Angostura. Agatha looked nervously at her own glass, which was smeared with lipstick at the rim. Mrs Cartwright sat down and crossed her legs. Her feet were encased in dirty pink slippers. All this pink, thought Agatha nervously. She looked like some sort of debouched Barbara Cartland. Did you know Mr Cummings Brown well? asked Agatha. Miss Cartwright lit a cigarette and studied Agatha through the smoke. A bit, she said. Do you like him? Some. Can't think straight at the moment. Because of the death. Because of the bingo over at Eversham. John, that's my husband. He's cut off my money on account. He doesn't want me to go there. Men are right bastards. I brought up four kids and now they've left home and I want a bit of fun. All he does is grumble. Yes, give me a bit of money for the bingo and I can't remember most things. Agatha fished in her bag. With £20 help? Would it ever? Agatha passed the money right over. Then there came the sound of the front door being opened. Mrs Cartwright thrust the note down into her bosom, grabbed Agatha's glass and ran with that and her own to the kitchen. Ella? called a man's voice. The door opened and a strongly built ape-like man walked in just as his wife came back from the kitchen. Who's she? he demanded, jerking a thumb at Agatha. I told you not to let those Jehovah's in. This is Mrs Raisin from down Lilac Lane, cool, social-like. What do you want? he snarled. Agatha stood up. Mrs Cartwright's large dark eyes flashed a warning. I'm collecting for charity, said Agatha. Then you can bugger off. I haven't got a penny to spare. She's seen to that. Sit down, John, and shut up. I'll see Mrs Raisin out. Agatha nervously edged past John Cartwright. Mrs Carter opened the front door. Come tomorrow, she whispered. Three in the afternoon. Was them was there some sinister mystery or had she just been conned out of twenty pounds? Agatha walked thoughtfully down the road. When she got back to her cottage, Mrs Simpson was hard at work in the bedrooms. Agatha washed a load of clothes and carried them out to the back to the back garden, where there was one of those whirlig whirligig devices for hanging clothes. Feeling more relaxed than she had for some time and quite domesticated. Agatha pegged out the clothes. As she moved around the other side of the whirligig, she saw Mrs Barr. She was leaning on her garden fence, staring straight at Agatha with a look of cold dislike on her face. Agatha finished pegging the clothes, raised two fingers at Mrs Barr and went indoors. Post came, shouted Miss Simpson from upstairs. I put it on the kitchen table. Agatha noticed a flat brown envelope for the first time. She tore it open. There was a large print of a woman on the tower at Warwick Castle. Agatha shuddered. Those staring eyes. That hate reminded her of Mrs Barr. Pinned to the enlargement was a note. Thank you for a splendid weekend, Steve. She put the photograph away in the kitchen drawer, feeling even after she had closed the drawer that those eyes were still staring at her. Overcome by the need for some escapist literature, she drove down to Morton and Marsh, swearing under her breath as she remembered it was market day. By driving round and round in the car park, she was able to secure a place when some shopper drove off. Walking through the old marketplace, as the new mini shopping arcade was called, she crossed the road and walked between the crowded stalls to the row of shops on the far side, where she knew there was a second-hand bookshop. In the back room were rows and rows of paperbacks. 
she bought three detective stories one Ruth Rendell, one Colin Dexter and one Colin Watson and then returned to her car. She flipped open the Colin Watson one and was caught by the first page. Oh, the joys of detective fiction. Time rolled past as Agatha sat in the car park and read steadily. Finally, it dawned on her that it was ridiculous to sit reading in a car park when she had the comfort of her own home and so drove back to Castley, just in time to meet Bill Wong, who was standing on her doorstep. Okay, everybody, that's all I'm reading today. I hope you've enjoyed the episode and I will see you again very shortly for a new one. Bye.